Hello, this is the second in the series of talks about functional MRI task-based data analysis at individual level, the analysis of functional MRI time series. In this talk, I'm going to focus on some basic concepts about fMRI data to orient ourselves for the model building talks that follow. So there's a lot of terminology in fMRI, jargon even, you might say, as there is in every field, compressed vocabulary to uh, make communication easy and consistent between people. So number of subjects is an obvious thing. There's the number of conditions. That is, the conditions are something called tasks. Uh, a stimulus within a condition is a trial or an event, and there are different types of those. There can be a factorial design of experiments, which is not a subject that we'll go into in these talks. That's more for the experimental design and group analysis talks later. There's the number of sample size, the number of repetitions per condition. fMRI data is not good enough to show one picture of a face, acquire some images, and then find the, f the face area in the brain. You need to repeat it over and over again to average out, to reduce the amount of noise effect on the relevant betas. This is experiment design. Is it going to be uh, the task going to be a block together? Are they going to be individual events or a mixture of the two? And this is dis distance in time between the stimuli. Should they be regular or random? These are all decisions that a person needs to make. Jargon. TR is the time between repetitions. A repetition is a 3D volume of acquisition, typically uh, about two seconds in fMRI, but it can be as low as a tenth of a second with ex extremely accelerated imaging methods. Echo time, the voxel size, the number of 3D volumes, the slice sequence it could be interleaved slices, multi-slices at the same time, slice thickness, whether or not the scanner automatically removes the first few TRs of data or not. All these are l little tiny details that are extremely important in, in properly analyzing the, the data. Scanning terms that are in common parlance, uh, run, uh, an imaging run is a continuous scanning and usually there's a brief break between runs so let the scanner and or subjects uh, rest a little bit. So you might scan for five or ten minutes and then take a one minute break and then five or ten minutes again and so on. A session was a subject's return after a long period of time. You might have five or ten imaging runs in a session and then you might never bring the same subject back or you might bring, an, uh, bring, bring them back to get more data or for longitudinal purpose. And an experiment or study is a whole collection of subject sessions. There are two classic types of experiment design in functional MRI and other neuroscience uh, technologies. Uh, the first is the blo block or the boxcar design, where each block of stimulus lasts for more time than the bold response takes to rise. So that means 6 to 10 seconds or more. And each block is under a single task condition, for example, watching a video clip or a series of sh short exchangeable trials. So for example, might be a face image is shown for a second and the person has to make a, a choice about whether it was a person with black hair or a person with blonde hair. And, they, and then bang, 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 one right after they're a second or two seconds apart, and that's a block. And the bold response from these close-in time trials, over, they overlap and you can't really tell them apart in the data, which is a subject we'll see in a later talk. And the bold response, though, is often visible in time series because of this overlap and because of the structure in, in, the, in the time series of the model, which is long, long things. So we can see long responses because our eyes are good at seeing that. The signal to noise ratio, how the, the bold effect, the, the blood oxygen effect on this MRI signal is about the same as the noise size in any given uh, time, time voxel time series, which is actually good. Another type is the event related design where, where each event or trial is distinguishable from the others, which means they have to be spaced far enough apart in time for the bold responses to be separately identifiable. And to do that, the events are usually uh, spaced randomly in time, not always, but most of the time. 
wall response to the stimulus tends to be weaker since you don't have nearby in time activations that overlap and, and reinforce each other. And so the randomness and the weak response combined to so that the data looks more like no noise. Uh, even if there wasn't any noise, it might look like noise. And then if you add noise in, the data really looks like noise. And there are mixed designs that contain both events and blocks. For example, there's a queue at the beginning of a 20-second block that says what, pay, what to pay attention to. Say you're showing a sequence of face images, and so there's a face, and you have then the queue is uh, press button one if the face is angry, and button two if the face is happy in in one block. And then there are ten ten images in a row. And then the next block might be is is it a female face or a male face? So it might be sim very similar images, but the attention is different in each one. So this is called a mixed ev block event design. And then there are naturalistic stimuli, for example, uh, watching a movie. And this might be a very long. You might watch a uh, 20-minute uh, video, a fragment from a Hollywood movie, perhaps. Uh, this is not really covered directly here. This, In many ways, it's kind of like resting state analysis. There's no task response model, but there are plenty of regressors of no interest to reduce unwanted effects. The, the most unwanted of them is subject head motion. And so... The regressors of no interest parts of these talks and of the resting state preprocessing talk, which comes later, will uh, are all extremely relevant to naturalistic stimuli. So, conceptually speaking, we divide this, the data that we have into signal, things that we like, and noise, things that we don't like. The data comes from the scanner, and in our case, is voxelized time series. The voxels voxels, uh, perhaps 100,000 of them through time, several hundred time points typically. The signal is the bold response to the stimulus, effects of interest plus effects of no interest. We don't know the real thing to look for in the data. This is not uh, understood completely. So we look for idealized task responses, but you have to be aware at all times we're looking for an idealized response, not we're looking, we don't know the truth we're just getting an a crude approximation of the truth. And there are different ways to do this. We can The responses we look for can have a fixed shape. We just want to know how much of it. Did it, it goes up and down in a certain amount of time, and how much do we need to fit this task trial? Uh, or we have the signal shape. We can also allow the shape to vary using a method called basis functions. And in any case, of a, what's in, of interest is the effect size for the task regressors the task response models, and those are the betas. Of no interest are the baseline, the slow drifts, the head motion effects, respiration. These all affect the data and uh, cause in, in affect the MRI signal and have to be modeled and, and then ignored usually. Noise is components in the data that interfere with signal detection. And basically it's the part of the data that we can't explain with uh, model components. And we have to make some assumptions about its probability distribution to be able to carry out statistical tests on the betas of interest. The, so the data is the baseline and effects of no interest in blue plus responses to different kinds of stimuli. You might have, uh, say, face stimuli. You might have sound stimuli, auditory. So you have two different kinds of stimuli. Or you might have angry faces and uh, happy faces. So that depends on your study, what the different, how you break your things into different uh, categories of responses. So how do we construct these regressors of interest and the regressors of no interest? Well, those are the upcoming talks. So here's an example of block data from a single run in a single voxel, something that is often not seen in papers. People just don't show single voxel time series in papers. At best, if they show time series, they'll show them averaged over a group of subjects or a group of voxels where the data looks really clean. But here's this is single subject, single voxel data from a single imaging run. This happened to be a sensory motor task, but it doesn't really matter. It was 27, a block 27 seconds on of stimulus and 27 seconds off with a repetition time of 2.5 seconds, and there are 130 time points in this one run. And in the experiment, there were 10 imaging runs. So here's a single... Uh, time series in a single voxel, and it runs uh, the black curve. You see how noisy it is. 
But you can, and above it is the model regressor in red. That's what the model regression time series is going to look like. And the blue overlay is the fit of the baseline plus the drift in the baseline and the and the red curve to the data and you can easily see that the signal goes up and down in synchrony with the red curve but there's a, the noise is about the same as the block activation size from a single block you could never say that uh, th this thing went up and down reliably there's just too much uh, randomness it's why you need multiple repetitions but uh, and you can hear also see in this one the clear need for a baseline that drifts downward because, or possibly upward in a different voxel because otherwise we wouldn't have such a good fit. If so, the activation and am amplitude and shape vary across blocks. You can see this quite quite clearly as you look through the blocks. Uh, but we in this model, as you'll see, this is called the fixed shape model. We assume that the shape and size are the same in each each, each individual block. Uh, that that means there's one beta. If we had a different amplitude for each block, we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six betas, one for each block. That could be done too, but generally speaking, it's not done. However, in uh, why do these things vary between blocks? That's a good question. Without any extra measurements, it's, it's not obvious. The subjects breathe differently. The uh, habituation to the task, they just were stopped paying attention in some places and others. Good question. Those are all possible, all of them. Here's some event-related data. There were, in this case, there were actually four different related visual tasks, and the, and the ideal model for those is given in the red curve at the top, which by itself looks pretty noisy. This is the single best voxel fit in the brain of this of, in this subject, and you can in the blue curve again plots the fit to the black curve, and you see that it actually goes up and down in relative synchrony, and the correlation coefficient between the uh, of the fit is 0.56, which is really very high, and more commonly in strong data in fMRI with event related, it's going to be like about 0.2. So this is a really good fit, and it still doesn't look so exciting. But the real lesson from this is simply that event related fMRI activation is not obvious to the to the eye. So thank you and stay tuned for more.